A Stolen Letter Story Story Overview In this story, a famous detective tries to find an important letter that has been hidden in a house. The police have already searched the house many times and they have searched very carefully but the letter has not yet been found. The detective uses his own methods to hunt for the letter. Here is the story. The man was clever but not clever enough. In Paris, one freezing winter evening, I was having dinner with my good friend, August Dupin, the famous detective. We had just finished our meal, when there was a loud knocking at the door. Dupin opened it. There stood Mr. Germain, the chief of the Paris police. We welcomed him warmly, for he was an old acquaintance whom we had not seen for a long time. I need your assistance, said Germain. I would like your opinion about a case I am working on now. It has been giving me a great deal of trouble. Please sit down, said Dupin, as he pointed to a comfortable chair. The case is simple, said Germain. It is very simple, indeed, and yet it is very strange. You say the case is simple and strange, said Dupin. Yes, the truth is we are puzzled because the case is so simple, and yet, at the same time, it has baffled us completely. Tell us about it, said Dupin. Before I begin, said the chief, let me caution you to keep this secret. If anyone found out that I confided this to you, I would certainly lose my job. All right, go on. Well, then, said the chief, I have received information from a highly placed person in the government. I have learned that a very important letter has been stolen from an office in the royal palace. We know who stole it. There is no question about that, for the man was seen taking it. We also know that he still has the letter. But who would dare do such a thing? I exclaimed. The thief, said Germain softly, is a man who dares to do many dangerous things. He is one of the most powerful and important ministers in the government. He is Minister Danton. Dupin shook his head and then whistled softly. Every day, said the chief, it becomes more and more important to obtain the letter. You see, its contents could be extremely embarrassing to the government. Therefore, it is important to get the letter back as soon as possible. The case has been given to me. I am personally responsible for finding the letter and returning it. Are you sure, I asked, that the minister still has the letter? I am sure of that, said the chief. Therefore, my first move was to search the minister's house. The problem was that I had to search the house without his knowing it. I had been warned of the danger that would result from giving him reason to suspect our plan. But, said Dupin, you are an expert in these investigations. You have done these many times before. Oh, yes, said the chief. And because of that I was confident of success. The minister's habits were helpful to me too. He is usually away from his home all day. And I have keys, as you know, that can open any door in Paris. Every day for the past three weeks, I have been personally involved in searching his house. After all, my reputation is at stake. Not only that, but there is an enormous reward. So, I looked everywhere in the house. I checked every place where it might be hidden. I searched every corner and crack where the letter could possibly be concealed. I finally abandoned the search when I was convinced that it was not possible to find the letter. This man, Danton, is even more clever than I thought. But isn't it possible, I suggested, that the minister has hidden the letter somewhere outside the house? That is not possible, said the chief. It would be far too dangerous. Besides, I have agents who watch him all the time. Then the letter must still be in the house, I said. But could the minister have the letter with him? Not at all, said the chief. I have arranged twice to have him robbed. Both times he was carefully searched and nothing was found. You might have saved yourself the trouble, said Dupin. Danton is no fool. He must have anticipated that he would be searched and would have been prepared for that. Why don't you tell us how you searched his house, I said. We took our time, said the chief, and we searched everywhere. As I said, I have a great deal of experience in this sort of thing. We carefully searched the entire house, room by room, spending many days in each. First, we looked at the furniture in each room. We opened every drawer. And, as you know, to a well-trained police officer, such a thing as a secret drawer is impossible. Next, we inspected the chairs. We used long, thin needles to see if anything had been hidden in the cushions. Then we removed the tops from the tables. Why did you do that? I asked. Sometimes the top of a table, or other piece of furniture, is removed by a person who wishes to hide something inside. Then the leg is hollowed out, the article is put into the cavity, and the top is put back on. But, said I, you could not possibly have taken apart every piece of furniture in which it would have been possible to hide the letter. After all, a letter may be rolled up very tightly until it is as thin as a pencil. Then it could be hidden, for example, in the hollowed out back of a chair. You did not take apart all the chairs in the house, did you? No, but we did even better. With a powerful microscope, we examined the wood on every piece of furniture in the house. If there had been the slightest sign that it had been recently disturbed, we would have detected it immediately. 
Under the microscope, a few grains of dust would have looked as large as apples. A drop of glue would have been obvious to us. I presume you checked the mirrors and beds, the clothing in the closets, the rugs, and the curtains. All that, of course. In fact, we examined every item in the house. We divided the house into squares and gave each square a number. Then we carefully inspected each square with the powerful microscope I mentioned to you before. You looked among Danton's papers, of course, and at his books. Certainly, we not only opened every book, but we turned over every page. We examined the covers of the books and the backs of the books too. You looked at the floor underneath the carpets? Absolutely. We removed every carpet and checked the floorboards underneath them. And the wallpaper? Yes. You looked in the basement? We did. In fact, we even checked the grounds around the house. Everything was covered with bricks. That made it very easy for us. We examined the moss between the bricks and found it had not been touched. Well, you certainly went to a great deal of trouble, I said. Yes, replied the chief, but as I told you before, the reward is enormous. Then, I said, I guess you were mistaken about the letter, and that it is not hidden in the house. I am afraid you are right, said the chief. Then turning to Dupin, he asked, what would you advise me to do? Without pausing for a moment, Dupin responded, search the house again. But, said the chief, as sure as I am breathing, the letter is not there. That is the best advice I can give you, said Dupin. Oh, by the way, you have, I guess, a good description of the letter. Oh, yes, said the chief. He pulled a small black notebook out of his pocket. Then, slowly and carefully, he proceeded to read aloud an accurate description of the missing letter. When he finished reading, he left. I had never seen the man so unhappy and depressed. About a month later, I received a message from August Dupin. The great detective had written, This is to inform you that I have asked Chief Germain to meet me at 7 o'clock this evening. Why don't you come by then? I think that you'll find it very interesting. When I arrived, Dupin greeted me at the door. Ah, you're exactly on time, he said, and there is Chief Germain, just a few steps behind you. The three of us chatted pleasantly for a while. Finally, I asked the chief, whatever happened to that stolen letter? Well, he said, a little sadly, I went back, as Dupin suggested, and searched the house again. But, as I knew in advance, it was all in vain. We did not find the letter. How much was the reward, did you say? Asked Dupin. Why, a very great deal it's a very large reward. I don't want to say precisely how much, but there's one thing I will say. I would gladly give my personal check for 50,000 francs to anyone who could get me that letter. I mean it. I would happily give 50,000 francs to get my hands on that letter. In that case, said Dupin, you can write me a check for the amount you mentioned, and after you have signed it, I will hand you the letter. I was astonished. The chief stood there with his mouth open, staring at Dupin. The chief finally recovered. He grabbed a pen, wrote a check for 50,000 francs, and handed it to Dupin. Dupin looked at the check carefully and put it in his wallet. Then, unlocking his desk, he took out a letter and handed it to the chief. With a trembling hand, Germain unfolded the letter, glanced at the words, and dashed wildly out of the room. He had not uttered a syllable since Dupin asked him to write the check. When I got over my shock, I turned to Dupin and said, Please be good enough to explain. With great pleasure, said the master detective. With very great pleasure. I know that the Paris police are very capable. They are hardworking and smart, and they do their job very well. But in this case, they search for the letter the wrong way. What do you mean? I asked. Don't you see? said Dupin. In searching for the letter, the chief and his officers thought only about how they would have hidden it. The chief believes that everyone would hide a letter in some secret out-of-the-way place in the leg of a table or under the carpet, and if it had been hidden in a place like that, I am sure that the police would have found it. But I know Minister Danton very well. He is a very intelligent man. He knew that his house would be searched. He knew that the searchers would use a powerful microscope. And, therefore, he knew that he could not hide the letter in any of the usual hiding places. I realized, then, that the minister might have left the letter out in the open right under everyone's nose, where no one would search for it. The more I thought about the case, the more convinced I became that the minister had hidden the letter by not hiding it at all. With this idea in mind, I put on a pair of dark glasses and went, early one morning, to the minister's house. I found the minister at home and he led me to his study. Once there, I complained about my weak eyes, which forced me, I said, to wear the dark glasses. The dark glasses, you understand, enabled me to look carefully around the room without permitting the minister to realize I was doing that. All the time, while I pretended to be interested in what the minister was saying, I was really looking around the room. I saw nothing suspicious until my eyes stopped, suddenly, on a cardboard letter holder on a wooden shelf over the fireplace. The letter holder had three compartments. In them were several cards and a letter. 
The letter was soiled and crumpled and was torn nearly in half. It looked as though someone had started tearing it up and had changed his mind. The letter was addressed to the minister in small, neat handwriting. The letter seemed to have been dropped, without much thought, into the letter rack. As soon as I saw that letter, I was certain that it was the one I was seeking. It is true that this letter looked very different from the one that the minister had described to us. That letter was addressed, in large handwriting, to an important official in the government. This letter was addressed, in small handwriting, to Minister Danton. But the letter here was soiled, crumpled, and torn unusual for the minister, who is so careful and neat. And the fact that the letter was there out in the open where anyone could easily see it that made me very suspicious. So, what did you do? I kept talking to the minister about a subject that I knew he found fascinating. But all the time I kept staring at the letter, memorizing exactly how it looked and exactly where it was placed in the holder. And then I saw something that convinced me I was right. What was that? I asked. I noticed that the folds in the letter seemed to be a bit worn. It was as though the letter had been folded, and then folded again in the opposite direction. I realized then that the letter had been turned inside out, like a glove, and had been addressed again on the other side. What did you do then? I said goodbye to the minister and departed, but I purposely left one of my gloves behind, so that you would have a reason to come back. Dupin nodded. The next morning, I returned for my glove. While the minister and I were talking, we suddenly heard loud shots coming from outside. The minister rushed to the window, opened it and looked out. As he did, I hurried to the letter holder. I quickly took the letter and put it into my pocket. Then I replaced it with another letter that looked exactly like the first. The shots in the street, it seems, had been caused by some fool who was firing a gun. But since he was shooting blanks, no one was hurt. The fool, of course, was a man I had hired to create a disturbance. A few minutes later, I said goodbye to the minister and left. Well done, I cried. But tell me this, why did you bother to go back to replace the letter with one that looked just like it? When you saw the letter on your first visit, why didn't you simply grab it and run? Minister Danton, replied Dupin, is a very dangerous man. When he is at home, there is always an armed guard somewhere in the house. If I had made the wild attempt, you just suggested, I might never have left his place alive. The people of Paris might never have seen me again. Dupin paused thoughtfully, smiled, and then said, I wish, however, I could see the look on the minister's face when he finally opens the letter I left. Why? Did you write something special? It did not seem right to leave the inside of the letter blank. So, I wrote in these words, Your plan was good, but mine was better. As you can see, I took the letter.